actually a, a public health consultant by background, so I sort of come from a public health perspective to the 100,000 Genomes Project. Uh, and the 100,000 Genomes Project is a, a sort of a, a large government project to sequence 100,000 genomes within the NHS, and it's, it's a major NHS transformational program. So what I was going to do was I was going to talk first off a little bit about personalised prevention, personalised medicine, the implications for public health, uh, and then talk about sort of some of the impact of the 100,000 to sort of contextualise that. Um, so for those of you that were having a bet on as to how soon we would get to a definition of public health, I, I think the second slide is probably quite good, but most of the time when we get to public health masterclasses, you always see a definition of public health first up on the first slide. So. I put this up um, because I wanted to sort of just make a, a point that when I actually discuss with a number of my, my friends and colleagues about public health and the implications of genomics and what we're doing with public health, there's often a, a lot of debate about the relevance of it because of the sort of, it's working on an individual basis. Um, and I'd just like to um, sort of pull out that, that, you know, in this definition and, and various others, I think, was this was sort of based on the Winslow definition in 1920. There was a focus as sort of also on the organised efforts of society. And very much I see part of the relevance of, of genomics to public health is that we actually have a role in public health about the organised efforts of society. So the question is, how do we make this work, not on an individual level, but on a societal level? Uh, and that's where I'm going to sort of go and talk about public health and personalised medicine. So I think we're, we're entering a new area, uh, an era of, of personalised prevention. We're, we're, we're sort of working more towards this, and this, this takes into account sort of a much more sophisticated system, there's both informatic systems and uh, diagnostic technologies where we're able to look at individual susceptibility to, to, to risk, uh, but also sort of individual views and actually taking that into account and making that work as a system. Uh, an example that I always give of this in the way that I think about this is that you know, search engines will often direct themselves on computers towards what your previous search history is. You don't have an individual tailored person pouring through looking at what your, your search history is to decide what the things are that should come up top for you. It's all done by algorithms. So it gives a personalised experience, but it's done through a systems way. Uh, and actually that's where I think we need to be thinking about this. Of course, this actually goes through you know, a lot of the focus at the moment, I think, on, on personalised prevention and personalised medicine is, is actually around uh, better diagnostics. Uh, but as that um, becomes more and more in place, then actually we'll see a, a, an ongoing impact of, um, uh, on the development of response to invent, uh, uh, interventions. Uh, and certainly a, a lot of the work that we're doing with cancer in the 100,000 Genomes Project we can see that actually this will lead to new trials which will give more sophisticated understanding of those trials. So I think the statistic, don't quote me on this, but I think the statistic is that 60% of cancer treatments don't actually work. Uh, and part of the sort of personalised medicine approach is saying, well, how can we identify the people who, who make that, uh, who for whom it would work? So you go straight to the effective intervention. And of course, actually, that's about research and having the ability to pull out subgroups to look within that. Um, here are the, the, the four, four P's of personalised uh, uh, medicine, and it's prediction and prevention. So prevention is actually quite at the heart of this, and as I said, more precise diagnosis and targeted interventions. Uh, I, I would say, uh, when I was speaking to a, a, a public health colleague about the implications of this in terms of, sort of screening and cancer screening, um, uh, one of them said to me, well, Tom, you know, I get the idea of... Um, uh, that you would be able to use this genomic, this more precise approach, the more sort of stratified uh, for screening. But I, I don't buy the genomic testing because I don't think that that's worthwhile. But if you were to do it with, say, deprivation scores or other factors and get more precise things, then I totally understand that. And for me, that's actually the point, is that it may be that actually as we think about personalised medicine, it's not all about genomics, it's actually about taking that approach and applying it in a more systematic way. But the thing is that genomics is really driving the thought about that, and that's one of the things that I think is really relevant to public health. So if you take away just sort of thinking about the framework of an individual differences type approach to public health, then for me that's a real success. So, you know, again also, no masterclass would be complete without a triangle. And um, here is my triangle. Um, uh, uh, and this is just sort of building up the sort of framework of understanding about how 
can be through personalization. So, you know, it's targeted disease prevention, early disease detection, accelerated diagnosis, targeted therapy, and then improved outcomes. And, and the concept is uh, that, um, that, that this will actually lead to more effective treatments and potentially even cost savings. Uh, I would say, it, it, I think the fact that it's not actually got cost saving in the title means it's in with a good chance of it actually being cost saving if we implement it appropriately, but again, perhaps don't quote me on that. So there has been a lot of work by NHS England. We're one of the few countries with a personalised medicine strategy. It's actually surprisingly readable. I suggest that you, you Google it. And, and within that, it um, covers different areas where they think that there's more likely to be a, a, an approach that is likely to benefit from personalised medicine type approach. In the 100,000 Genomes Project, we're focused on cancer and rare diseases, and this is because it was thought that whole genome sequencing would be most tractable in that particular area. And I should say uh, pathogens as well, and I, I'm not going to be touching very much on pathogens, but I do know that we've got sessions later on today, and I do think that that's a, a very interesting part of this. And many of the challenges around using data and information are actually very, very similar there. So I'd just like to give a sort of a practical example. Um, so here are five different babies with different um, forms of neonatal diabetes. Uh, and actually five, five different treatments are needed in this particular situation. So if you've got more effective ways of actually doing diagnosis for these, you can target what those appropriate interventions actually are. But just to show that I've not completely lost my public health roots, uh, this I think the maturity onset diabetes of the young is a really brilliant example uh, of the importance of personalised medicine because this is a group of people who actually don't need uh, insulin treatment and they're often mistaken in terms of requiring that. So this means that if they're identified in, um, uh, in antenatal screening and misdiagnosed, that's a lifetime of treatment. So you know, I've been involved in, in looking at this and I was involved in sort of developing it as a uh, clinical pathway as an exemplar. Uh, and actually, you, if you save a lifetime worth of treatment, then actually it's cost effective at almost any cost. It's a really good example of how, even though it's actually very rare, because of the cost of the lifetime treatments, it is actually very effective if you can identify it. So the vision with personalised medicine as, as probably is all of the visions, is that we move from uh, illness to a to health-based model, um, where it's earlier diagnosis uh, and, and earlier treatment uh, and stratified medicine. So going on to um, uh, more of the genomics aspect of it, you know, we have a, a long tradition and history of genetics and genomics in the UK. And, um, we were very much involved in the first sort of human genome, and I'm sure that many of you remember that. Um, it's interesting to think, you know, the cost, the cost of the first human genome was uh, $3.2 billion. So if we were to do 100,000 genomes at those prices today, then it would cost quite a lot. So the reason why um, actually this is becoming something which you can think about implementing in much more effective ways is that the cost of sequencing has just dropped so much, and there's a Moore's law is a law of electronics that says how prices should reduce in to, uh, uh, with technical innovation. And actually what you can see is that at the sort of time of the announcement of the 100,000 Genomes Project, we'd gone from the sort of, uh, well, the 3.2 billion uh, down to less than $1,000, which is a huge drop. I'd just like to, to also touch on the fact, I'm sure that there'll be others who go into more detail about this, but you know, when the first human genome was done, there was a the concept of junk DNA, and people said there were the important bits and then the non-important bits. And then surprise, surprise, everybody suddenly realized that what they thought was non-important was actually quite important as well. So genomics is the science of all of that DNA. So if you're looking for a definition of that, it, it is covering the whole thing. So in terms of the 100,000 Genomes Project, um, this is a huge transformational project that's designed to bring in a new technology into the NHS. Uh, and rather than doing it sort of piecemeal, actually what it said is we're going to do it as a national objective and implement it across the whole country. Uh, it actually is a legacy of the, um, the, the 2012 Olympics, because as part of that, they had a number of horizon scanning meetings where they were saying, what should the UK be investing in in the future? Uh, and this was one of the suggestions that came out of that. Um, there were 
number of recommendations that were, were, were put in about how this should be implemented. Uh, and there was a focus on ethics and the importance of ethics, and I believe we've got a session later on about the implications of ethics uh, uh, within genomic medicine. Um, but, but also, uh, it focused on what were the most translatable bits of the sequencing technology, and that was thought to be rare diseases and cancer. So quite often people say, well, why are you not looking at diabetes, or well, sorry, Alzheimer's or you know, uh, diabetes, not in terms of early onset, but the sort of wider ones. Things that are sort of um, complex diseases. And the reason is that we're not actually, don't, those are not tractable to whole genome sequencing in a clinical sense at the moment. But actually, I can foresee very much in the future that it will. So part of the 100,000 Genomes Project, I think, is building the infrastructure to be able to, to take advantage of that in the future. I'm sure that you, you all saw there were some key reports that have come out. Uh, one is the CMO annual report, which was on uh, uh, Generation Genome, where she was talking about the impact of this. And I think one of the things that may interest a lot of the public health people was a lot of the comments about data and the implications of data. So I think that's very generalizable to a variety of sets of um, places. But also there's the industrial strategy uh, and this idea, and I'll, I'll go into this later on, but that the uh, we need to be bringing together research and um, clinical transformation much, much closer together. So the 100,000 Genomes mission, moving on to that. Um, so we've got four main aims, uh, to bring benefit to NHS patients, to enable new scientific discoveries, to create an ethical and transparent programme based on consent and to kickstart the UK uh, development of the, the industry. I find it kind of quite funny that we've got an express aim that uh, we're going to be ethical and transparent because I don't really know any NHS initiatives that aren't trying to be ethical and transparent or would have an opposite aim to be unethical and untransparent. Um, but I think it does say something about the fact that we, we have that as, a, as something that's there as a, a very important strand within the programme, is that actually there's a lot of concern about data and genomics and therefore stating this as a key plank of what we're doing is actually about making a statement to the public that this is something that is considered important. Um, so I think that that's, that's kind of quite interesting. The, the other thing that I'd just like to bring out that I kind of find quite funny, I was, um, when I started with the 100,000 Genomes Project, uh, we have an independent ethics advisory committee that is, uh, uh, that is chaired by Mike Parker, who is a, a, an ethicist. Um, and there was a, this is filled with the great and the good. And there was a big debate between sort of people about whether or not the program was um, in clinical transformation or whether or not it was research. And this went on for about 40 minutes between all the people. And then it was actually, we had a patient representative of cancer patients on, the, on that particular panel. And he put his hand up and he said, this is really simple. It's all about patient benefit. So it's about NHS transformation, but you don't fully know how to do it yet. So it's research as well. I get that, the patients I represent get that. It's you professionals I worry about. <laughs> and I, I think you know, that really for me sort of made the point that actually the future does need to be bringing these together, but the challenges are often our challenges rather than necessarily the challenges of other people. And um, certainly having sought to patients with rare diseases who are wanting a diagnosis, they don't mind if it's a researcher that's done that uh, and come up with new gene discovery, or if it's done in a diagnostic laboratory. Uh, we care about that because we want the diagnostic standards to be applied, but actually the process of getting there is, is their agnostic to it. So the, the idea that these are separate is, is actually, I think, arguably a false dichotomy. So just, just in terms of numbers, oh, um, I'd just like to give people um, an idea of, of what are the challenges that we're dealing with. So um, I, I love this statistic. So when we've done 100,000 genomes, there are gonna be 21 petabytes of data to deal with. Um, one petabyte of data is 2,000 years of music on an MP3 player. That's quite a lot of data to move around and challenge and deal with. So that's one of the big problems. And actually, data interpretation is probably the biggest challenge. Um, it's literally finding a, a needle in a, a haystack or actually, you know, even harder than that. And so that's why one of the things that's actually very important and a driving part of the 100,000 Genome Project is saying that clinical data is just as important part of the test, just an important part of the process to help interpret it uh, as actually taking a sample and getting the sequence. 
Uh, and I think that that's quite, quite a novel and quite a change that's required for the way that people are thinking about it. Because people don't usually order tests and go, ah, oh, but I need to write out all of this clinical information. And actually part of the change and transformation we've seen, at least in rare diseases, is the importance of that. So just to give you an idea about how the 100,000 genomes works, um, you've got patient consent. They provide samples, clinical data, and also longitudinal data. So we're, we're linked up to PEZ and the cancer registries and ONS death uh, outcomes and a variety of other things. Uh, they go into our biorepository and our sequencing centre, and that all goes into the Genomics England data infrastructure. That can be uh, returns reports and is, is, is accessed by, by clinicians. Uh, but also um, GSIP, which is our academic users and industry, can also access that in a de-identified way, and that's where the, the research comes in. Um, perhaps quite rather importantly, uh, although it started as Genomics England and within, the, uh, within England, uh, we've now actually um, set up so uh, both uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland are taking part and are sending through either samples or sequence data, and uh, Wales is just put its ethics approval a couple of weeks ago. So it is actually a pan-UK programme. So why do we make diagnoses? Um, I think it's important for us to sort of think about this for those people who aren't necessarily that, that used to working in that field, but it's you know, paramount for the, for the patient, understanding why their condition happened uh, uh, and ha how it might um, develop in the future and what treatments might be available. Um, it's also for the family as well because there, there are often reproductive decisions or, or, or choices uh, that, that, that will impact on that. Uh, and finally, um, it also helps us with medical research. This is my favourite slide. Uh, this is what you do get if you ask your director of bioinformatics to give you a slide explaining how they do the genomics analysis. Um, and then they say that you need a bit more detail. Um, and this is something that I, I, I like to show because I like to sort of just get people to understand just how complex the bioinformatics actually is. So part of the challenge in translating this is taking the complexity of this and then actually making it into a, something that can be implemented in the NHS. Here's a slightly simpler diagram of what we actually do. So this is the one that I actually prefer to talk to. So in terms of rare diseases, what happens is we get the, the patient and the family uh, and they provide us with DNA and phenotypic information. That goes through uh, to our um, uh, through our bioinformatics processes, and also through there are certain annotation companies that do analysis for us. Uh, and with that, what we're doing is we're looking for the known known. So we spend a lot of time pulling together the knowledge base of actually what you should be testing for, and that's done with an open source something called uh, the Panel App, where we've been essentially crowdsourcing the sort of genomic knowledge both around England but also around the world um, to say what we should test for. So then based on the phenotypic information, uh, we then decide which genes to actually look for. And that gives us a, a sort of tiering of what we think is more likely to be a, a, a diagnosis or, or, or not. And then that's passed back to the NHS where they look at it with their more knowledge about the actual individuals uh, and assess which of those are likely to be real. Uh, and then validate the outcomes for that and feed that back to us so that we can actually improve our diagnosis going forward. Uh, and I think that the rare diseases is a really interesting model because actually uh, one of the important things about this is that we need to share data between lots of people to improve the individual's diagnosis. It's a really clear example where sharing data directly benefits the individuals who take part because it improves their chance of a diagnosis. And I think as we think about healthcare systems going forward, and how we use data. The idea and the concept that actually sharing data may improve people's individual clinical practice is something that's a really important concept. And then here you've got the GSIP, so the people who we don't have a diagnosis for, we then pass over to the research arm to start looking at for new gene discovery. With the cancer reports, there are some examples on um, uh, our website, but again, it takes a, a, a similar approach where there's a preliminary report which has things that are, are potentially directly um, uh, relevant, uh, and then other cancer genes that are relevant to other bits. We've also actually added uh, germline findings, so if there's predisposition there, uh, that will come back as well. Um, I would say that with the cancer, the real challenge is how you actually sort of uh, get it quick enough uh, and returned quick enough. 
Uh, and it's fair to say that actually at the start of the 100,000 Genomes Project, the challenge, you know, it was, it was never going to be returned in a time that was quick enough to impact on specific care of a cancer episode. Although actually there have been a number of people who it has really affected in terms of recurrence where they thought uh, this is going to change treatment uh, and we've got some examples of that. Uh, but we've set up a fast track system and we're now actually for a small number returning reports uh, within, 20, within 20 working days. So a whole genome sequence analysed within 20 working days of the sample being sent to us, which is kind of incredible really. Um, we're doing that with 40 samples or 40 patients a week, so we need to get that bigger, but it, that's just a matter of logistics. Um, what are we telling participants? Well, as we're a, a, a hybrid um, uh, model, we're based under sort of research uh, uh, ethics, um, but what we say to them is that um, if they're going to take part, they have to get uh, information back on their uh, pertinent condition. So you wouldn't expect someone to go into a GP practice and say, measure my blood pressure, but don't tell me the answer. Um, and that's kind of, you You wouldn't do that unless you were going to act on it. And our principle has been the same in that they have to sign up to what their pertinent condition is being acted on. But with the genome, there's a lot of other data that you could go looking for as well that might actually impact on care. So we've actually said that there are, where we can find things which are going to impact on your care, uh, you can choose for us to also look for those. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting the debate about this because there is a school of thought that says that you should be very specific and say these are the things that we're going to look, look at. Uh, with the 100,000 Genomes Project, we've taken a broad consent type approach where we basically said, well, we don't know because the knowledge is constantly changing in this area. So it's up to you. You can decide for us to look for things and we'll look at it based on whether or not they're actionable within the NHS. And if you don't like that uncertainty, that's fine. You don't have to. But that means that every time there's a new discovery or new knowledge, we don't have to go back and re-get consent from people to look at that. So clearly I'm biased, but I think that's a much better way of doing it. Clinical Interpretation Partnership, that was launched at the Wellcome Trust in 2014. It's over 2,600 um, academics. And, and I think that here is the real challenge is how, do, so we're trying a model. This is, this, it'll be interesting to see how effective it is, where we're saying, how do you actually bring the clinical academics and the academics much, much closer into the sort of clinical world? Uh, and so this is, uh, this is I, I consider, what we've built is we've built a model that doesn't rely on these people, but what we want to do is we want to have the extracting, so this is the sort of sprinkles on the top of the cake, in that if we can get it to work, it will add real value. I think we're gonna cover later on, but I always mention, you know, part of the 100,000 Genomes Project has had a key focus on uh, education and training and the importance of that, and actually, that's what sort of Annika is leading. I personally, by the way, did totally, as a, uh, 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 they've not prompted me to say this, but I do think that the health education program on genomics is one of the best. Uh, when I go around the world and talk to other countries about their genomics programs, they often say, um, uh, they're often most interested in this because their challenges around how they upskill the workforce. And so they're always sort of coming and knocking on Annika's door because of this. So, so I do think yeah, we are world leaders in terms of our education bit, which is a promise totally unprompted by them. Um, also sort of key and a part of the 100,000 Genomes Project is that We've had patient involvement. We've both got a national program commenting on it, but also uh, uh, each of the genomic medicine centers have uh, patient participant groups. We've actually got participants on our access review committee, so they decide um, who it is who gets access to the data and who doesn't. And of course, it's quite interesting because uh, we had one application which was around, uh, for the research side of things, wanting to get more detailed <coughs> geographical information. And we were there going, or we're very concerned about this, we're concerned about people's identity. And it was the participants on our access review committee going, well, we understand there are some laws about this, but you guys should be doing this. Why aren't you doing this? Go and figure out a way to make sure that this research can be done. It's important research. And I think as advocates of, of access to data, you know, patients and participants are actually really important. And in fact, this is a, this, this is a good example of that. So when we were setting up our, our pipelines, uh, some of the early successes while we were testing those, uh, this was one of the first diagnoses. Um, and the gentleman, uh, uh, he is affected, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think he's had two renal transplants. Uh, his daughter is also affected, um, but when they found the, uh, 
you know, what the cause of this was, they were able to show that the, the, the granddaughter was not affected. So again, that means a lifetime of not being worried about that, a lifetime of not having monitoring and checking, a, a lifetime of, of um, you know, not having those medical interventions. Uh, but more importantly than that, when we actually sort of did this, we did the announcement uh, about this, uh, some of the press people came and spoke to that, that man and they were pushing them about the data issue and they were saying, you know, are you worried about sharing all of your data? Uh, and, and he was saying, why, why wouldn't I want this? Why wouldn't I share my data? Why wouldn't I want this for everyone else? This is really important. So uh, as advocates of data sharing, uh, I think that the people with rare diseases actually are, are particularly a strong voice. And similarly also, here's, here's, here's stuff about the, the, the first children. So in terms of progress to date, um, we've got to do 100,000 genomes. We have collected in the NHS uh, uh, around, well, almost 70,000 uh, samples. Uh, we've got to the end of next, next year. In terms of genome sequenced, we're almost at 40,000 genomes. Uh, getting through to the reports has proved slightly more challenging to build a, a pipeline. And, and some of that is, well, to give an example for rare diseases, um, it's actually, if you've got the best family structure, uh, uh, you're much more able to make a diagnosis. And so traditionally people have looked for mother, father and, and, and child, or at least for, for certain modes of inheritance. Um, but in the NHS, you can't say to someone, I'm terribly sorry your mother has died, you can't have this test. That just doesn't work. And so actually part of the challenge in us building our bioinformatics pipeline is that we've got to build it in a way that enables us to use all of the family structures uh, for reporting. And that much, much greater added complexity of applying it in real life has meant it's taken us longer than we thought. However, we've, we've had over 3,000 reports on families returned to the genomic medicine centres now. Um, we've got a diagnostic rate in people who were thought to not have a, a diagnosis of around sort of 20 to 25%, and that's our conservative assessment before it goes out to um, uh, the actual genomic medicine centres. So the clinicians who I, I work with who look at this, uh, they, they don't want to be seen as over-enthusiastic, so I expect this actually to increase, uh, uh, but it's, it's sort of at around that amount. And so, and also we've had almost 20,000 whole genomes that are in a research environment that people can start working on. So, so that's quite exciting, but what's even more exciting for me is that we're now hitting a stage where we're going through and saying what the next step is. And that's a genomic medicine service. And so at the moment, there's a re-procurement of, of the genetic laboratories. Uh, uh, there's a looking at how the service is going to use. We've actually moved from a situation where this was a, a research translational program to a, we're, now, we're now in the process of commissioning a new service. Uh, and for me, that's, that's sort of proof that this is a, has been a, a, an effective approach. Um, I'd just like to say, I shamelessly steal lots of slides from other people. I don't want to pretend that I don't. So some of these were from Sue Hill, the Chief Scientific Officer of NHS England. Some of these I quoted from PhD Foundation, some of the Academy of Medical Scientists. Um, the other set of people is the, our comms team at Genomics England. Uh, they do all the slides for me. They're, they're also in an unofficial race with the 100,000 genomes to get 100,000 followers before we get 100,000 genomes, and I'm their best recruiter. So uh, I would, would ask, if only for the fact that actually it sort of continues to persuade them to do the slides for me, that you follow us, um, because that would be greatly helpful. You're saying that you have a turnaround time of 21 days for these urgent cancer cases. Are you actually analysing every single gene, or are you simply looking at the genes known to be involved in cancer and sequencing? I think part of the challenge about how you actually make this work within the NHS is not getting people to look at every bit because you saw the things about the data, but actually to transform it into a digestible format to be able to, to make best use of. Um, and so that's why there is this focus on the sort of known actionable genes. But also I think in the longer term this will lead to a more personalised approach, will lead to the, the you know, uh, potentially more trials in this area using sort of whole genome if we're, uh, if we're genome friendly. Um, I, I, what I didn't really cover on um, is actually some of the transformation in the 100,000 Genomes Project has been um, 
the issue. So the early work was hoped that we would be able to do the whole genome sequencing on uh, formulin fixed paraffin embedded tumor samples. Uh, and actually that was found that that just doesn't work for whole genome sequencing. And so we had to move to sort of fresh frozen samples. So a lot of the work that's been done has been about how you actually change the pathways to allow fresh frozen. So um, what we're seeing a lot is sort of seen implemented in George's, uh, and, uh, St. George's in London and uh, Bart's, but also starting to be across the country, is genomic friendly biopsy pathways for breast and, uh, and others, where they will take sort of two two or three biopsies and treat it in a way that is the traditional way and taking one for the system off for the genomic sequencing. And regardless of whether or not you actually think that um, whole genome sequencing is going to be the future for cancer or there are going to be panels or other aspects of technology in this space, the development of those genomic friendly pathways are likely to have a huge impact. And it, it means that uh, I think sort of future proofing, because I think it won't only be genome sequencing, but there'll be all sorts of omic samples that become more important in the future, and actually having those pathways embedded, which, which is probably why, to be honest, we're behind with cancer, whereas rare diseases is roaring ahead. Um, so all of that implementation challenge has been part of what the program has been trying to address. The question is whether is there any chance to access this type of data for analysing other types of genes, or you're collecting data where you already know genes you are looking for. So the whole genome sequence covers the whole of the genome, so we have all of the data there. The, the, the challenge is about how you actually pull out the things that are most pertinent to healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we also uh, have it in such a way that um, uh, as knowledge changes, people can go back and look at this. But in terms of the academic research, the GSIP community, you can join online on the Genomics England website, but basically we've said that there are different sets of people and fundamentally the academics get free access to the data in return for working on the data to help us with clinical effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, uh, that, that's why it's kind of it's an experiment about how you make data available, but engage researchers with, um, with the more clinical outcomes aspect of it. So, so, so the answer is yes, just go to the website okay. and sign up. Can I ask another question? The age range you are collecting this data at the moment, considering you are looking at the rare diseases, is it over 60 or? It's the whole, the whole gamut. It's all population. So, so what you generally see is you see a bit of a bimodal distribution because there are, in general, uh, you know, childhood onset diseases which people pull in and then actually the late onset kind of from 50s onwards. And so it's higher in those two age groups in rare diseases because that's when uh, they sort of tend to manifest themselves, but it is across the whole whole spectrum. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned metabolomics, and I was wondering if there's any plans to extend this into epigenetics and other omics areas. So, as part as part of the hundred thousand genomes project, there were a number of omic samples that were collected, and that was more under the research bit rather than the clinical bit. That's in the um, that's in the, the, the to be collected in the biobank. I think when we move towards the clinical service, actually there won't be the justification for doing that in a uh, clinical setting because it, it's not being used. I mean, we're taking them and storing them at the moment. Um, however, a part of the re-procurement, a part of bringing together sort of uh, includes a section on the need for being able to be sort of supporting research. So I think what we're doing is, uh, well, NHS England is doing and we're collaborating with them is building an infrastructure that allows that when funding comes in to happen much more effectively through the NHS. So the opportunities are there, but I wouldn't say that we're doing it going forwards. But as I'm an optimist, when we prove that it's clinically effective, the systems will be there to do that. You mentioned deprivation. Yes. Yes. In all our programs, yeah. generally speaking. Yeah. So how will um, this program be managed so that it really does proactively and proportionately allocate this program across the generation rating? That was my first question. If that's all that's required, it. and the other one was around how do we use it for real prevention? Um, so, so the the point about deprivation I was making was that actually a personalised approach in which you identify individual risk and then. Um, uh, have targeted interventions like screening. It doesn't just have to be genomic information, it can be a variety of other sets of information. So it's about this concept of more, you know, 
targeted risk approach on an individual basis, and we already do it in cohorts of people with screening, but actually if we can build systems where we you know, almost individually target, that by definition will be more effective, um, arguably. Um, so in terms of your, your question about uh, whether or not the programme is affecting um, uh, deprivation, uh, so we, we've done a number of sort of maps where we've looked at um, uh, where we've looked at how it uh, uh, has sort of spread and the coverage and aspects like that. And one of the challenges is that when you're setting up a new technology and a program, by definition, you're starting at one point and going out. So it's very hard to say, you know, you could look at it one way in the program and say, you, you know, people over here have got hardly any, whereas people here where the initial centre was have got loads. Um, the West Midlands is actually a very good example where they've got a number of local delivery partners across the whole, whole of the... Um, uh, uh, regional area uh, sort of recruiting as part of the rare disease program and the cancer program so I think partly it's about that partly it's about moving to a commission service where you say these are the standard tests that are going to be there and partly it's going to be about the standard stuff of constantly monitoring to make sure that that it is implemented but by embedding it in services that actually have wider requirements about equity of access I think that that's the way we're going to go forward um, but you're right. It's 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 a challenge. It's going to be, um, uh, an, you know, it's 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 any 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 large program does have that impact, but then it does hopefully spread out to everyone after that. I, I think it's important to get it in the strategy at the beginning. That's all. Well, so 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 the program was set up in a way that um, the data collection, the sample collection was a commission service from the NHS as any other commission service. So actually the same requirements around the NHS constitution and all of those things were there right from the start. So I, I would say, of course I'm biased, but I would say that the, the strategy around deprivation is, has been an, an essential driver. And there are a number of um, KPIs that each genomic medicine centre are assessed on and they are uh, every quarter asked about these particular issues. So yeah, there is effective monitoring. And you're right, it has to be there from the start.